All right, my name is Tobin Northfield. I'm an assistant professor at WSU, and I'm going to be talking about X disease vectors. So little cherry virus 2 and X disease phytoplasma can both be spread by a number of propagation or cultivation practices. One is that you can bring infected trees into the orchard. You can also propagate infected material, or you can have root grafting between neighboring trees. The other thing that can happen is that you can have vectoring by leafhoppers or for the case of X disease phytoplasma or by mealybugs for little cherry virus too. And I'm going to be talking about X disease phytoplasma and the leafhoppers today. There are a number of leafhoppers that are able to transmit the X disease phytoplasma. There's Colodonus reductus and Colodonus geminatus are the two main ones that we have here. Those are the most abundant, but there are a few others that we also can get here that can transmit the, vi the phytoplasma. So th these are the two, Colodonus geminatus and Colodonus uh, reductus. They're fairly small, they're about a two and a half millimeters long and about a millimeter wide. The Colodonus reductus is uh, shown here by this yellow stripe, and this is really indicative of this species. Colodonus montanus also has it and has a yellow patch on the back. Sometimes reductus has a yellow patch too, but it's very small. One of the key identifying factors for Geminatus is this photo or image of Dennis Hopper on the back. Uh, the, you'll notice a, a hat, you'll notice sunglasses, and you'll notice a mustache. We've colored them in here for those um, that need their imagination a bit stretched. And if, when I remove it here, you can see that the, those, those appear. There are other techniques that people can use, but this has been the most useful for us. So one of the things that I, the questions I get asked a lot are, why don't other leafhoppers transmit X disease phytoplasma and how can we be certain of this? And there are a few key barriers to limiting the X disease ability to be transmitted from one leafhopper, from leafhopper from one plant to the next. The first is that it has to be feeding on the right part of the plant. Some types of leafhoppers like, uh, like sharpshooters actually feed on the xylem, and so they obviously wouldn't come into contact with the phytoplasma and the phloem. So that's the first step. The next thing it has to do is it has to go into the gut of the leafhopper, get absorbed through the gut, go into the hemolymph, or the, the blood of the leafhopper, and that can be a fairly tricky process for that phytoplasma to, to go through. The next thing it has to do is make its way through that, that hemolymph all the way to the salivary glands near the mouth, where it can then be transmitted into the next plant. This is a long process that can take about a month, and the whole time the insect's immune system might be fighting against that phytoplasma, because the phytoplasma is actually infecting the leafhopper too, and in many cases uh, is actually reducing the fitness of that leafhopper. And then once it gets all the way to the salivary glands, only then can it transmit to the next plant. So monitoring is going to be really important for these leafhoppers. And there are a few different ways that we can do it. One is through sweep netting. You can, and primarily, uh, one of the best methods is just to do sweep netting along the ground cover where they're feeding on alternative weeds. The next thing is uh, with yellow sticky traps. And these are, as long as it's yellow and sticky, that'll work. Uh, you can put them uh, generally below five feet uh, um, near the, between the canopy and the ground cover. And then replace those weekly so that you can get those uh, in for that information fast enough to where you can make management decisions. We're also evaluating some traps that can preserve that DNA so that we can take those leafhoppers and figure out if it has phytoplasma or figure out what its previous food sources are. But those will probably be mostly for research purposes uh, due to cost constrictions. So for trap height, generally, like I said, below five feet, and it really kind of depends on what they're feeding. If you have an orchard that's out of control, then you might have higher uh, trap heights that are catching more leafhoppers because those leafhoppers are moving around in that canopy and feeding on those trees. However, if those trees are protected, they're probably going to be feeding more along the ground cover, and then you'll have higher trap catch are in the two to four foot range. So generally, we suggest about three or four feet should be fine. Leafhoppers will jump from what they're feeding on onto those traps. One of the key things that has uh, arisen from our uh, investigation of these leafhoppers is that the leafhoppers are abundant after harvest, and that can be a really important time for management. 
In the 1950s, in the dolls, there was a researcher named Mervyn Nielsen that developed the phenology for these leafhoppers. And he found that they first appear in May and then again in the August-September period. And studies in California found that the leafhoppers are more likely to acquire the phytoplasma later on in the season. And then Scott Harper's group found that phytoplasma titers or concentrations in the plants are actually higher later on in the season too. And so this really highlights the importance of this time period of August and September uh, when the phytoplasma is high in the plants and then, or high in high concentrations, and then the leafhoppers are abundant. So one of the other key things in controlling this is that the phytoplasma is not transmitted from the um, leafhopper from generation to generation or from the plants from generation to generation, say, for example, in pollen or in seeds. And so leafhoppers overwinter as eggs, which means that that leafhopper is not able to take that phytoplasma from one year to the next. The only thing that can take the, leaf the phytoplasma from one year to the next is perennial plants. The reason for that is that the roots of the perennial plant can host that phytoplasma over the winter and take it from one year to the next. This shows how important perennial plants are. And this is one of the reasons why tree removal is absolutely critical. The other thing that it may, uh, it may um, introduce problems with is perennial plants that are host for the phytoplasma and the leafhopper, but are not um, cherry trees that may be alternative hosts. And so we started evaluating some of these. And there are a number of plants that are in and around orchards that we thought might be important. Peach is known to host uh, phytoplasma and leafhoppers. Alfalfa is a host for leafhoppers. White clover might be dandelion and mallow. And dandelion has been shown to be a uh, host for uh, phytoplasma. We just didn't know how common leafhoppers were feeding on it. So we decided to evaluate these in some host, chest, host feeding trials. And basically the idea here is you give them a variety of plants and see what the leafhoppers choose. So a master student in my lab, Abby Clark, evaluated these where she put uh, cages. She put a tree, a, a small tree in, in the cage and with uh, three herbaceous plants. And the idea there is that then we can monitor these leafhoppers and see which ones they're feeding on. And the idea also is to replicate an orchard scenario where you have trees and then some sort of ground cover. She had um, these in, in growth rooms, about 75 degrees, and she had uh, 10 to 15 leafhoppers. And they were all Colodonus reductus. And the reason for that is that these were 97.5% of the leafhoppers that we collected in the field, and there's the least amount known about these leafhoppers. So what we found was that when we had cherry or peach, they did readily feed on both of those trees, but they also fed a lot on herbaceous plants. So the first time we didn't have mallow, then we uh, added mallow, but we removed alfalfa, and then finally we added alfalfa, but we removed clover. All of those plants uh, were fed on by the leafhoppers, but a couple things stood out. One is that they really like mallow. If you look at the pie charts, Green represents mallow, and you just at first glance, there's a lot of green in those pie charts. The pie charts represent the proportion of feeding observations on each of those plants, and so immediately, like they fed a lot on, on mallow, they also fed a lot on alfalfa, as well as these trees. So uh, these could be really important in management. So then the question is, well, how then do we manage these orchards knowing that these are going to be potentially uh, good hosts for the phytoplasma and potentially for the leafhopper. We still have to figure out uh, the, the rate of hosting for the phytoplasma, but we now we know leafhoppers love these. So we also know leafhoppers are generalists, and so we don't necessarily have to um, kill all of them. We just have to get them to feed some on some, something else or somewhere else. So we evaluated two different treatments. One is kale and clay, or surround. And the, the advantages of this is that it's already used for doubling in, in some orchards. It has a long residual time. And then because we're focusing on post-harvest application, when we know the leafhoppers are abundant and the phytoplasma levels are high in the plants, uh, we don't have to worry about the surround or the clay sticking to the fruit because the fruit are gone. The other thing we want to look at was ground cover or extende. And here the idea is just to cover up all those alternative host plants so that there's nothing else for them to feed on. And the other advantage here is you can just put it out once. Uh, you leave it out for the season. You can use it for multiple, multiple years. Um, and then because of the COVID um, 
problems. We, had, we were only able to apply these to four of our, our blocks uh, in Wenatchee, um, but we did do some evaluations of that as well. So the experimental design, we worked in 10 different uh, commercial orchards. Eight of those were cherries, two of those were nectarine, uh, and we had three treatments, kaolin, extende, and con control. Each of those treated sections was a 12 row by 200 feet long section. So one of the things that we keep, keep in mind here is that these are not things that you can do just on a small like, bioassay scale. We had to do this on larger scales. One of the things that we did in, in developing this was have these larger sections of blocks, but then randomize the order of these. And because we had a lot of different blocks, we could uh, evaluate uh, that variability between these groups and randomize the order that they were in. When we look at the phenology, there are three peaks that occur in Wenatchee. One was in uh, June, then again in August, and then finally in October. And uh, Yakima had a similar uh, pattern of phenology, but it was offset a little bit. And one of the things that we realized was that these peaks in August and October are actually different generations. It could be that before we knew this, that, that it could be that they're just moving at different times. And maybe in October, it's the same leaf hoppers that emerge in our August. They're just moving in from somewhere else. But so what we did was collected those leaf hoppers in August, put them on plants in uh, field conditions, and then uh, monitored those and found that those leaf hoppers laid eggs that then produced adults around October. So we know now that those are two different generations that are both occurring post harvest. When we looked at the results from the experiments, and I'll show here a couple of the blocks in Wenatchee, just in the, for the sake of time, surround did reduce the abundance of the leafhoppers in the blocks and extend they reduce it even further. Uh, and so those were both uh, early on in the season and then later in the season. Surround seemed to have a stronger effect later on in the season. But that's not the entire story for surround. We looked at the, the movement at different heights. And so Adrian who, Marshall, who conducted this research, set up uh, traps at two, four, and six feet high. And the reason for that was to see where those leafhoppers are moving in each of these different treatments. And one of the things that we found was that in surround, uh, we had a uh, much higher trap catch at the two foot traps and less so at the four and six, suggesting that those leafhoppers are kind of staying around in the ground cover and not moving up into the canopy as often. And that would make sense if that surround is somehow deterring those leafhoppers from the treated trees. So in conclusion, we found that reductus was by far the most abundant vector in our control plots. It feeds readily on a lot of common ground cover weeds, especially things like mallow and alfalfa. We think that they might actually prefer more of a diverse diet, but those are two important uh, host plants. There are three generations, uh, and two of those occur after harvest. Surround and Extende each reduce leafhopper abundance, and Extende had the largest effect, likely because it is removing those uh, alternative host plants. And so in the future, we would like to evaluate some uh, er, um, selective herbicide treatments to see if we can remove those alternative host plants, because we know that grasses are not a good host plant for leafhoppers, and they don't host the phytoplasma. So grasses are actually our friend in this scenario. So if we evaluate uh, ways of just removing those broadleaf weeds, we may actually have a similar impact of removing the, the uh, weeds through Extende. So with that, I want to thank uh, Mabby Clark, who is a master student that conducted a lot of this research, Adrian Marshall, who's a postdoc in my lab that uh, conducted a lot of the field trials, uh, all the cooperators that work with us, um, the Research Commission and uh, Oregon Sweet Cherry Commission and the WSDA for funding these projects. And thank you so much. And if you have any questions, there are a number of resources uh, that we have um, at treefruit.wsu.edu. Um,